Good morning. Sure good to see everyone this morning for our Sunday morning Bible class in Proverbs. Michelle Shalomo, Proverbs of Solomon. As we continue, we are starting this morning with questions on 26 and uh, then proceeding from there. May I ask if anyone needs a copy of our questions on chapter 26 this morning? If you do raise your hand, there may not be anyone that does. There's Billy Reese to your left right there. Anybody else over here? Questions? Thank you, Bill. I appreciate that. Last time we concluded 26 with talking about the busybody. I don't remember if we pulled in First First Peter chapter 4 that says, Let none of you suffer as a meddler in other men's affairs, but that would be the equivalent of that. And we talked about foolish jesting and uh, contention and gossip, and then the matter of hypocrisy, and that's where we closed out. And uh, Eric, I'm showing you took the last question, last time, to complete chapter 25, is that correct? Well, I've got it right here, it must be true. So let's begin with a word of prayer, and then we'll proceed from there. Dear Father, you bless us with another beautiful day. From you all blessings flow, and we want to pause to thank you for life and breath and everything that sustains life. All things come from you. We're thankful that as we know we are unworthy, that you delight in us, and that your people are your own special treasure. We pray that on our part we would treasure that relationship with you above all else. Thank you for your word. Thank you for the book of Proverbs and the wisdom it contains. We pray for knowledge, but we also pray for a spirit of wisdom and understanding. And we pray to be able to bear fruit unto every good work. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. So did everyone enjoy the extra hour of sleep last night or extra hour of the last night? You know, you've always heard the joke about somebody that stays up till 2 a.m., you know, set the clock back. I did not do that, but it was just interesting. We have one of those satellite clocks. Does anybody have a satellite clock? You know what I'm talking about. So I just happened to look up at the ceiling where it projects the time, and it said 2 a.m. Okay, you know, I just happened to see that. And so then closed my eyes, a couple of minutes went by, I looked up, and it was one something. So I didn't exactly stay up to set the clock back, but I did witness, in a manner of speaking, the, the time change. So uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's start here, Bill, with you as we continue with our questions. This is 26, question number one, please. Often, oftentimes, a word picture really communicates an idea. Sometimes we say a picture is worth a thousand words, and we're talking about a literal picture of something that helps you visualize more than a lot of words would uh, be able to explain that. But even without the photos, word pictures also, uh, in a very brief way, Make the point. You say, yes, that, that would be a bad thing. You know, uh, we're raining in the harvest. Okay, number two, we continue. Does it take wisdom to know when to anger a fool and when to be stopped? Okay. We continue with number three. The message is sent by the hand of the fool. What is it like? Number six. Okay. 
Would you say that's another uh, word picture? Can you visualize someone cutting off his feet? And how, um, shall I say, how unhandy that would be? How unproductive that would be? You know, sometimes we use the expression of somebody shooting himself in the foot. We, we, everybody's heard that. That's the idea of, a, of self-inflicted harm. But that's used to, again, well, what we're doing in, in this section we have seen, we, uh, we observed last time, that this is a little unlike the other Proverbs of Solomon in that here are these that were copied by chapter 25, verse 1, the men of Hezekiah, good King Hezekiah. Uh, in, this, in, in this arrangement, what we have is like right through here where it's a lot of verses about the fool, just one after another. So you have more clustering of verses right through here. So we continue with number four. Okay, number five. You think about that, we, we don't tend to use that kind of slingshot anymore. Um, usually if somebody has a slingshot, it, you know, it's the fork stick with the, with the rubberized bands and then the pouch in the back and let it fly, but the biblical sling would, would have the two strings and the pouch and you'd be slinging it around and really crank up the velocity. You hold on to one string, you let the other fly, and then the stone flies. But you could... <laughs> If, if it's bound up in the sling, you could just stand there and sling all day and release all day and it doesn't go anywhere. And so that, that again is the word, word picture. Talk about word pictures, we've got another one with question number six. Okay. Yuck. I mean, is there anything more disgusting than that? But uh, this, and, and Peter, uses, Peter uses this in 2 Peter, not just to talk about the fool, but the one who was in sin, who has become a Christian, delivered from the defilement of sin, and then goes back, to, after he's cleansed, he goes back to what he used to do before. And he quotes from this very proverb. Number seven, we continue. Okay. So really these first 12 verses right through here, it's just one after another, characteristics of the fool, word pictures, how uh, if, if he's a messenger, it's not going to work out well. If he tries to be a philosopher and teach, it's not going to work out well. So all these various aspects of he doesn't learn. It's one thing to make a mistake, but the idea in verse 11 is the fool never learns. He just keeps on and uh, the cycle continues. So what happens is in this arrangement, starting in verse 13, we shift the subject away from the fool to talk about lazy bones. This is the slothful man. This is the lazy person. So number eight is next. Okay. Now, in ancient Israel, were there lions? Well, do we read about lions in the Bible? Well, yes. Where did the lions tend to be? Where did they tend to reside? Wilderness, Wilderness Jordan thickets, inside towns, in the street. That's not very likely. Doesn't matter. The most unlikely kind of thing. You know, I'm just being realistic. You've got to get real here. Okay, we continue about the sluggard in verse 9. Yeah, I'm just not a morning person. I need more sleep. Got to get to sleep. Number 10 is next. Now, who knows how the word seven is used in the Bible? What, what does it tend to signify? Completeness. 
Sometimes you might say it's a perfect number, but it's the idea of completeness. And so this is used in that typical symbolic way. Seven men. Well, that, that's a complete number. Seven men who can render a reason. Seven wise men. You get them together, and here's their combined counsel of seven wise men. But the sluggard is wiser in his own conceit than all those seven put together. And it's really hard to help somebody like that that thinks he knows more than the combined wisdom of several godly, wise people. It's not that they can't render a reason. They can render a reason. But the reception part is where the breakdown takes place. That's sad. Number 11 continues. Okay, so here we leave the sluggard and we start talking about some other practical applications. Um, people that meddle in other people's business. And we're not talking about legitimate concerns where you, we are our brother's keeper. That's one thing. But a meddler like this is talking about, that's not a welcome thing. We continue though with other, other topics uh, that are placed here. Number 12 is next. You know, something that is funny, we all appreciate good humor, don't we? I do. Uh, now, I will tell you that my wife says my humor is warped. So, but, you know, Greg laughs at my jokes, so what does that tell you about him? But things that are funny, that's one thing. But if it's hurtful, if it is injurious, if it's doing harm, and then you think that uh, you, you can play the card, oh, I was just joking. I, I, I wasn't serious about that. That's different. That's, and, and there's no excuse for that. But a lot of people do that. Oh, well, you, you, you know, I wasn't serious about that. Number 13 is next. See, the, the, the gossiper, the, the talebearer, is the one that keeps putting the wood in, so to speak. N number 14 is next. Okay. Number 15. Okay. Number 16. Okay. That uh, is that the end of that row. You're the last one on that row. That's everybody. Okay, Brother Twilly, number seventeen. There's that number seven again. The idea of fullness, completeness. Next. Okay. If not in this life, there is a day coming that the secrets of the hearts of men will be laid bare. Romans chapter 2, verse 12, Paul talks about the day in which God will judge the secrets of the hearts of men by my gospel. But usually things like that catch up with you even in this life. Number 19. Yeah, whoever digs a pit will fall into it. Whoever rolls a stone will have it roll back on him. How often when a person's desire is to injure or hurt somebody else that what eventually happens as a result is he's hurt himself. He, his idea was he's going to make some point hurt somebody else, but he's the one that was injured in the process. That's where bitterness takes you. 
that's where the spirit of revenge takes you. Number 20 is next and last. Okay. Well, that made fast work of that, didn't it? Now, let me see. Cheryl, uh, this, this sheet has 26, and on the back is 27. Now, last week we gave out 28 and 29, so we're kind of caught up on the question sheets, aren't we? We'll, we'll uh, at some point print off uh, 30 and 31, and that will be it. And we're going to be looking at Proverbs as of the first of the year as we look ahead after we finish. Uh, we're going to be looking at Ecclesiastes after we finish Proverbs as of the first of the year. Hank Allen's going to be teaching the book of Ecclesiastes. He's already making preparations for that. By the way, Hank, good to see you and Teresa back from the Sunshine, from the sunshine State. Was it sunshine while you were gone? You didn't have rain? You did have some rain. Okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, it, it's, uh, Bill's talking about the gift of communication from God and the good that can be done, but the propensity for evil, and so many verses talk about that in the Old and New Testament. And um, our speech is so important. Let your speech be with grace, seasoned with salt, that you may know how to answer everyone. Let no corrupt speech come from your mouth, but such as is good for the use of edification. Yes, sir. May I also be worth noting that Jesus is called the Word in the first chapter of John, which kind of connects back to the first chapter of Genesis, where it says that God spoke yeah. things into existence. There's something about the nature of Christ that's bound up in the idea of, of communication. He could have been called any number of things, but he is halagos, the word. Very good. God has spoken, Hebrews 1, verse 1, and he's spoken through his son, Jesus Christ. Okay? Good. Well, let's see what we got in chapter 27. In chapter 27. We start out with something that is, uh, I guess, familiar to most of us. Again, like other things, because of its use in the New Testament. Do you find that to be true, that when you read something in the Old Testament that is, uh, is quoted in the New Testament, that it, uh, it kind of stands out there? And I think of James chapter 4. It says, Go to now, you that say, Today or tomorrow we will enter into such and such a city and buy and sell there and get gain. Whereas you do not know what shall be on the morrow. For what is your life? It is but a vapor that appears for a little time and then vanishes away. Indeed, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we shall live and do this or that. So, Proverbs 27, verse one in one verse is, is a, a springboard really from which the concept in, in uh, uh, James 4, 13, really 13 through 17 is based. So don't boast about tomorrow. By the way, I, 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 where I stop, where it continues there, uh, James says that such boasting is sin. You know, you, th you think about things that constitute sin, but, but when, when, you, when you talk about tomorrow and you leave God out of the planning in terms of if the Lord wills, 
we should live and do this or that. But I'm going to do this, I'm going to do that. Such boasting is sin. Um, I will tell you, we need to be impressed with our own littleness in regard to the future. We can plan, and it's a foolish person that doesn't plan for the future. And we, with God's help, bring to fruition things that we've, we've set as goals, hopefully within keeping with, within his will. But uh, we sure don't know what will be on the morrow. Let another man praise you, and not your own mouth, a stranger, and not your own lips. Um, Self-praise is really no commendation. Self-praise is contrary to the spirit of humility. Self-praise betrays a desire for self-exaltation. So... All of those things are out of order. By the way, there's another perspective in terms of uh, a point of application. Let another man praise you and not your own lips. If somebody has done something that is praiseworthy, do we need to stand ready to praise them for that? We need to be that other person, don't we, that's praising somebody for what is praiseworthy. A lot of times people have... I don't know if it's such insecurity or, or what, but uh, uh, they don't find it hard to criticize somebody. But if someone's doing something that, it, that is praiseworthy, you never hear from them about that. But uh, I, I think in terms of Barnabas, in Acts uh, 11, verse 23, when he had come from Jerusalem to Antioch, it says, and when he had come and had seen the grace of all God, Uh, He exhorted them all that with purpose of heart they would cleave to the Lord. Barnabas was an encourager. You know, his name was not originally Barnabas. It was Joseph. But he was so adept at bringing out the best of people and encouraging people that they changed his name to Barnabas. I'll tell you, there's some people that are not in any danger of being named Barnabas because they just operate on the criticism mode. But if something is praiseworthy, it's, it's okay to say that's, that's well done. That's a good job. Keep it up. But we'll get back to the fool again. Verse 3 says, A stone is heavy and sand is weighty, but a fool's wrath is heavier than both of them. Physical fatigue brought about by carrying heavy burdens. A stone is heavy and sand is heavy. Some of us have laughed. I don't know if Alicia has laughed. But some of us have laughed because uh, back in 2003, Alicia and I uh, went to Egypt. Actually, uh, I went to Egypt on my way to preach in, uh, uh, in Russia and the Ukraine. But I was prefixing those, the preaching trip with a, with a trip to Egypt for study and photography. And Alicia decided she had to go too, so she went with me for the Egypt part of the trip. But it was great. That was my first time to be there. So we were seeing, we were seeing the Great Pyramids. I was seeing the oldest pyramid in the world, the Step Pyramid. And, you know, I'm thinking in terms of the kids back home. I want to show them stuff and let them see stuff and feel stuff and uh, taste stuff. And so I, I would take a Ziploc bag and, 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 and get, put sand from the... Uh, Right, right there at the step pyramid, you know, seal it up. And here, I, here, Alicia, you don't mind carrying that for me. So uh, by the time she came back, and then I went on to Russia, she, oh, we got to the airport, and she was overloaded. And she was she was carrying all this heavy stuff, sand and rocks, and all this. It was all labeled, and it's all good stuff, and I've used it in teaching. But it was a funny sort of, if you weren't Alicia, I guess. It's still kind of funny to me. 
But the idea of carrying sand, the idea here of a stone is heavy, sand is weighty. It's so fatiguing, you feel like you're dragging. And see, the point of it is, that's what a fool does. He just drains people. It's, it's the fatigue that he causes by his actions, his wrath. You, to be emotionally drained because of someone you're, you're dealing with and his, his behavior is, is, is the picture here. And it's just the, the word picture again is that of somebody just, just toting just all the sand or rocks he can carry. And that's the way the, that the fool impacts others. Of course, he doesn't see it that way. But the individual that's bearing the brunt of it, he, he's got a real weight. He's really drained. So that's that word picture. Verse 4, wrath is cruel and anger a torrent, but who is able to stand before jealousy? And then verse 5, better is open rebuke than love carefully concealed. I'm reading from the New King James on that. Does anyone have a, another rendering on that verse? That's significantly... Hank, what's, what's the NASB on verse 5? All right, so the same thing. Uh, you remember that song by Reba McIntyre, The Greatest Man I Never Knew? One of the verses says, The greatest words I never heard, I guess I'll never hear. The man I thought could never die has been dead almost a year. He was good at business, but there was business left to do. He never said he loved me. Guess he thought I knew. I've talked to people that are grown-ups, but with tears in their eyes have told me that their parents never told them they loved them. Better is open rebuke. It's not that they didn't love them, but the communication that should have been there in a good sense. If that's not there, there's something really lacking. And that's, that's what this verse is talking about. Love that is concealed. In appropriate ways, our love should be shown and manifested. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. The wounds of a friend may be you don't want to do that. I think that's a bad idea. I think we need to talk. This, this isn't good. So he's not telling you what you want to hear. He, he's telling you he thinks that uh, your judgment is wrong about that. But that's a whole lot better than someone that is flattering and deceitful. Well, look at verse 7. We're, now, we're changing subjects a lot through here, aren't we? A sated man loathes honey, but to a famished man any bitter thing is sweet. Benjamin Franklin said, a hungry man never saw poor bread. So few of us know what it's like to be really hungry, to be really hungry. But this is contrasting somebody that could be just really hungry. Not that he skipped breakfast that morning. Not that he didn't have lunch either. Here's somebody that hasn't eaten in a while. He is famished, and anything, anything's going to taste good. But if you're already full, then um, you're satisfied. Here's something sweet. Here's something good. Honey, uh, doesn't taste good. Now, I know that that's true about food. If, if there's an application, it may be that we should not be so full of our possessions. There can be such an abundance of our possessions that we don't appreciate anything that we have. And so the concept would be, let's be one that appreciates the things that God has given to us. Verse 8 says, like a bird that wanders from her nest, so is a man who wanders from his home. You know, you look at that, and it's, it is intended that a bird wander from the nest. 
the time will come that they fly out and they're grown birds and they make nests of their own and have lay their eggs and have baby birds. But a bird could wander from the nest too soon before it's ready to go. A man could wander from his home when it's not really a commendable thing. That, it seems that in verse 8 it's not saying that here's a, a thing that's just a normal process that the man will grow up and then he will, he will establish his own home. It's, the, the idea of wandering may be somebody that likes, he's just not satisfied. He, just, he wants to change for the sake of change. Uh, here's somebody that's, uh, he's got his job, but he doesn't like that job. And have you ever known somebody to quit a job before he has another job? He quits a job without another source of income? I, I didn't like what I was doing. I didn't like the way things were going. Or somebody that leaves his spouse. He's wandering from his home. I just don't love her anymore. So not all wandering is good. And this seems to be looking... See, there's such a thing as being unstable. And it seems that this is the idea of, some, of, of instability. Of You know, when you start moving for the sake of moving, um, uh, in any of the ways that we've suggested, that's, that's not a good thing. But we continue. Oil and perfume make the heart glad. So a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Now, Raymond back there cannot appreciate this proverb about the perfume part. You know what I mean? Am I right, Raymond? <laughs> you don't mind me using, it's too late now. If, if, if there's someone that has an extreme sensitivity to perfume, that person, that is not going to be the person that says, that smells good. But those that do not have a sensitivity to that, you know, this is something in ancient times as well as today. I mean, cosmetics and fragrances, that's a pretty good thriving business, I would think. I don't guess Dee Bowman would mind me telling you this. Uh, when, when they travel, he says his wife has one suitcase, a whole suitcase besides the, their other stuff that uh, is cosmetics. And he says, I don't complain, it's working. So, uh, but the fragrances, uh, that's a pretty, cosmetics, that's a big business. So here's something that's pleasant. And so a man's counsel is sweet to his friend. Burden lifting advice. Someone where you've got that common spirit, you can just talk and um, the counsel is sweet. I don't know, I, I, was just, I was just thinking this morning. I, I, yeah, I don't know how things like that pop into your mind, but I was thinking about my friend Raymond Harville. And uh, the relationship that Raymond and I had was so close that there was a period of time that if one saw one of us without the other, if somebody saw me and Raymond wasn't with me, it's like, where's Raymond? That was the first question. But we spent so much time studying and eating and talking and just being together, traveling together. And I, I miss that kind of counsel and relationship. I miss him. Do not forsake your own friend or your father's friend and do not go to your brother's house in the day of calamity. Better is neighbor, a neighbor who is near than a brother far away. So the idea of, of true friendship, that friend that sticks closer than a brother, and there are times, it's not, not really saying don't call your brother, it's just saying that friend, true friend is close, call him, make use of that relationship. And uh, in that sense, that's better than a brother that cannot come because of the, of the distance. Be wise, my son, and make my heart glad, verse 11 says, that I may answer him who reproaches me. One time, years ago, I went through the book of Proverbs just looking for verses like this. Verses that are addressing the young person and making an appeal to the young person that if you are wise, it makes the heart of the parent wise. And uh, that it would surprise you perhaps how many verses there are that, uh, that deal with that. 
But that's true. To have a wise son or a wise daughter makes your heart glad, not because you're trying to live vicariously through your children. It's not because of something it's doing to you. You know, look, look at me, you know, look, well, I've got a wise child, so that makes me look good. It's, I, I don't mean that. But you're just so glad that for what's best for them, they're making wise decisions. They've made the faith their own. I have no greater joy than to hear that my children walk in truth, is the idea. A prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. The simple pass on and are pursued. A word that comes to my mind is, is the word vigilant. Or another word that comes to my mind is circumspectly, to walk circumspectly. You know, sometimes when it comes to just uh, paying attention for physical safety, what, what do people say? Be aware of your surroundings. You know, just be aware of your surroundings. Look around. See what's going on. Don't just you know, be looking down at your phone and fiddling around and uh, here, here's somebody with evil intent comes on you. Well, I didn't, I didn't have any idea. Well, if you'd been watching, you would have. But not just that, um, doctrinal error, just, just tendencies that, that are leading in the wrong direction. A prudent, a prudent man foresees evil and hides himself. Well, we revisit in verse 13 our finances. Take the garment of him who is surety for a stranger and hold it in pledge when he is surety for a seductress. The, the unwise pledge. Uh, here, here you make a pledge to a creditor that you'll stand in good for this person and uh, that's, uh, that should be done very rarely. And uh, when it says surety for a stranger, here's one you don't know that well and if he doesn't pay you're going to, to have to. I guess there's a bit of psychology there in verse 14 kind of makes me smile. I know it's true. He who blesses his friend with a loud voice rising early in the morning, it will be counted a curse to him. So, I mean, you might be feeling good. But, but if, if the volume is too loud and you're in somebody's face, you know, kind of early in the morning, uh, it's not going to be well received. So, um, I hate to tell you this, but Linda has used this verse on me a time or two. I might have, she said, now you, you've been up a while. And if, uh, often I, I might be the first to get up and, and have studied a couple of hours and uh, uh, even done a little exercise and stuff like that, pretty wide awake and when, when I first see her in the morning. And she will accuse me of blessing her with a loud voice. So I... I've been on the receiving end of this. So, here's something that's inappropriate, it's unwelcome. You know, um, there are just a lot of applications of that. It's, but the idea is, be, sens be sensitive to the situation. Our communication should be what is appropriate. Well, now we get to verse 15 and 16, they're a couplet. I don't think we've seen in this chapter so far anything that has not been introduced in other Proverbs. And, and the contentious woman has been a topic in several previous verses. 15 and 16. I need to get me a reader for that. Jason, would you read 15 and 16 for me good and loud? Okay, now... No book in the Bible says more about the godly woman, the worthy woman. If we want to talk about the worthy woman, what, where do we go? Proverbs 31. But throughout the book of Proverbs, there are verses that extol the wise woman, the good woman, the wise woman who builds her house, Proverbs 115, and so many verses about that. But here's the one that's like a, here's another word picture. She's like the continual dripping, drop. Drip, drip, drip. Have you ever noticed that you, you just keep hit, hearing that water drip like that? It'll about drive you crazy. And so here, this is talking about one that is contentious. This is talking about one that uh, is guilty of nagging. Now, nagging. 
that brings me to my subject for today. Nagging. So I want to talk to you about how to avoid nagging. These are points from Irvin Himmel, recently deceased, and he wrote a whole article on, on this subject. But realize that nagging has a negative influence. It's negative. And instead, contribute ideas in a logical way. Don't be the contentious person. Furthermore, to avoid nagging, learn contentment. To avoid nagging, be thankful. Gratitude deters discontentment. Radiate joy and love. You know, we can choose to do that. And, Brother Hamill said, show meekness with subjection. Now, of course, you could make the point that a nagging man, a contentious husband, is just as bad. And of course that's true. We're just looking at it from the standpoint of the way the proverb states this, and I thought those were some really good points that in summary that Brother Himmel made. He who restrains her restrains the wind. So it's, uh, it's that headlong, continual, nagging discontentment that uh, is not productive of any, of any good thing. So does anybody want to talk about nagging women, or can I move on? Oh, back up to 14. Oh, okay. sharpens iron. So one man sharpens another. So here's the, here's the good influence we can have on each other. Um, here you've got a concept, you mention that to a friend, and he'll say, yeah, that's, I can see that, and have you thought about this? And he might make a point you'd not even thought about before, but it fits in very much with that. And the, the really two together like that accomplish with synergism a whole lot more than two individually, independently working would do. Iron sharpens iron. So, sharp, so a man sharpens the countenance of a friend. Well, here's another um, ethic, work ethic verse. Whoever keeps the fig tree will eat its fruit. He who waits on his master will be honored. And uh, as in water, face reveals face, so a man's heart reveals the man. Verse 20 says that um, hell and destruction are never full, so the eyes of a man are never satisfied. Remember Ecclesiastes 1 and verse 8 says that the eyes are not satisfied with, with seeing. Verse 20 is interesting. The refining pot is for silver and the furnace for gold, and a man is valued by what others say of him. So this is... Um, this is a verse that has uh, some variance. I just read from the New King James. A man, the latter part, a man is valued by what others say of him. I think, did you notice the New American Standard says, each is tested by the praise accorded him. And the NIV there says, any of you have the NIV? It says that uh, a man is tested by the praise he receives. And um, you think about that. A man is tested by the praise he receives. Let me give you a Bible example. What happens after David kills Goliath? There's praise for David. There's praise 
for Saul. Remember how that went? The women were singing. Saul has slain his thousands and David his ten thousands. But a man is tested by the praise he receives. With David, he just spurred to go on and behave himself wisely. But Saul is jealous because someone else received more praise than he did. It was David that killed Goliath. And so the text is going to say he eyed David from that day forward. A man is tested by the praise he receives. Okay, verse 22. This is, this is one that uh, we're talking about the word fool. And the word fool in this chapter, this particular Hebrew word, which is the word avil, has uh, been found already in verse 23 about the heavy fatigue like sand and carrying stones. But look at verse 27 here. Though you found a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, let his, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. Now, like I said when I was looking at another word last week, I know you can, this is too small to read it. I was just showing you the Hebrew word that is used and, and the occurrences here in this chapter. But here is, uh, Brother Pender and I were talking about this the other day, uh, the, just this past week. This is uh, one of those things where we need a word picture. We, we have one. We just need to understand the word that's being used. All right, again, verse 22. Though you grind a fool in a mortar with a pestle along with crushed grain, yet his foolishness will not depart from him. So here is the mortar with a pestle. Uh, I photographed this one in biblical Antioch of Syria. You remember Antioch where Paul would begin each of his three journeys? They have a very nice um, a museum there. And so this is a very old mortar and pestle. And it's really the idea, th this, this was not a large one, this was a small one. Uh, in Capernaum, Capernaum is where they actually manufactured uh, millstones for grinding wheat and uh, they so in, in a uh, industrial sense you, you could have the big millstones then I've seen the kind that were made for two people where they had two holes where there would have been a, a, a piece of wood on each side where women would have been going back and forth like that illustrating what Jesus said in Matthew 24 two women shall be grinding wheat so the small, and so this is one, this is for a one man to use. This would be like in, in older times with the apothecary, the, uh, the, the physician, you know, using his own ingredients and herbs and medications to mix it up to make medicine back in the uh, older days of medicine. But you see, in biblical times, if, if it's just a household, if it's just, just a woman doing this by herself, she might have had something like this put the grain in it, just grind it up, and separate the wheat from the chaff and take that out. And, and of course, blow away the chaff. Then she's got the grain. Then she mixes that up and, and makes the bread. So that's the word picture that everybody knew. It's just that today we don't do that to make bread, do we? We go to the store and buy bread. But we need to understand what he's saying. What he's saying is instead of just crushed grain, you've got the grain in there, but you put the fool in there. And so he, you just grind him and grind him and grind him till he's like the wheat you'd grind up and the foolishness remains with him. Now that's some word picture. In other words, he is so committed to what is foolish that even if you grind him up, his foolishness remains with him. His foolishness will not depart from him. Now that's really a commitment to foolishness, isn't it? Yes, sir. Yeah, he'll still be set wiser than seven men that can render a reason. Yeah, that's right.
With kind pleasure, we welcome you to our services this morning at Hansville. We're glad you're here, especially if you're visiting with us, and we would like to invite you back anytime you can be with us. If you've not done so already, we'd ask you to fill out a visitor's card and place it in the collection plate or to give it to one of our members as you exit the building. Again, we're here to worship God, give Him the praise and the glory. If you've not silenced your electronic devices, we'd ask you to do that at this time. I'll be making uh, announcements at the conclusion of the service. As we prepare our minds to worship God, Jeremiah 10, verses 6 and 7, There is none like you, O Lord. You are great, and your name is great in might. Who would not fear you, O King of the nations? For this is your due. For among all the wise ones of the nations and in all their kingdoms, there is none like you. Take a few moments, or take a moment, and then we'll go to God in prayer. Pray with me. Our Heavenly Father, as we come before you this morning, we're very thankful for the opportunity that we have to gather together and worship you. Lord, we're very thankful for all the blessings that you've given us. Lord, we pray that you'll uh, help us to be reminded where our blessings come from and that we use those blessings in a way that uh, could bring others to you. Lord, as we go through this worship service, we pray that everything that we do today is in accordance uh, with your will. We pray that you'll be with Brother Leon as he speaks to us, and we pray that you'll be with us to be active listeners. Um, so we will take what's being said, apply that to our lives to let our light shine brighter. Lord, we pray that you'll be with us through the rest of this service, and in Christ's name we pray. Amen. set aside here by the elders for the members to members here to give a portion of what we have earned as uh, we are commanded to do. If you're visiting with us, we are glad that you're here, but we want you to understand we're not soliciting your money. <clears throat> if you will, pray with me. Our Father in heaven, we come before you again at this time thanking you for this day, uh, for the opportunity to come here to study your word and worship you. We are thankful for the facilities uh, that are here that provide us comfort uh, and ease. We are also thankful for materials that are provided that uh, allow us uh, to better understand what you want us to do. We're also thankful, Father, for the opportunities given to us as a group of your people to help aid those in other places to spread your word. As we make this offering at this time, we pray that our hearts were in the right place as we did as we did that. In Christ's name, amen. amen. Six, six, he loved me so.
Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, at this time we come before you once again asking that you bless this bread which to the Christians is representative of the body broken upon the cross for our sins. We pray, Father, that at this time you help us to set aside the uh, cares, concerns, and distractions of the world and focus on that uh, great and wonderful sacrifice made on our behalf. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. Likewise, Father, we ask that you please bless this fruit of the vine, which represents the blood shed upon the cross. Again, Father, we pray this is taken in a way pleasing to you. In Christ's name, amen. amen.
follow along in a song book, you may want to mark it to number 287. 287. There's a fountain free. That'll be our song of encouragement after our, after our lesson this morning. 287. Our first song will be number 538. 538. Majesty.
You'll be turning to first to Second Kings, Second Kings chapter six. I want to talk to you this morning about the time that the prophet got the axe. That's the title of my sermon this morning. The prophet gets the axe. We'll be reading that passage and seeing what we can learn from the text in just a moment. You know, when we come together on the first day of the week, the central purpose and focus is to break bread, to observe the Lord's Supper, to show His death till He comes. And that's central to our coming together. We do other things in our worship, but we come together on the first of the day of the week to break bread, as Acts 20 and verse 7 says. And as we do that, we focus on our Lord and Savior. That's where the focus is. Our focus is not on those who minister and serve. But having said that, I don't think it's wrong to be encouraged. Uh, I noticed this morning with the arrangement that was there that uh, the whole arrangement was father and sons. Did you notice that? And what an encouragement that is to, to see father and son standing alongside each other, serving at the Lord's table. That's not our focus, but it is an encouragement, and I appreciate that. 2 Kings chapter 6, we're going to read the first seven verses. And the sons of the prophets said to Elisha, See now, the place where we dwell with you is too small for us. Please let us go to the Jordan and let every man take a beam from there and let us make there a place where we may dwell. And he said, he answered, Go. Then one of the servants, verse 3, Then one said, Please consent to go with your servants. And he said, I will go. So we went with them. And when they were come to the Jordan, they cut down trees. But as one was cutting down a tree, the, ox, the iron axe head fell into the water, and he cried out and said, Alas, Master, for it was borrowed. And the man of God said, Where did it fall? And he showed him the place. So he cut off a stick and threw it in there, and he made the iron float. Therefore he said, Pick it up for yourself. So he reached out his hand and took it. Now these are the days of Elisha. Elisha was the successor of the prophet Elijah. We see this as of 2 Kings 2 and 3 when Elijah was translated, taken up the, the chariots, the whirlwind, the chariots of fire, the horses. So he's taken up and Elisha is his successor. The year that you would want to put with this to kind of keep in mind a bit of chronology would be about the year 852 B.C. I mention that because that I'm going to make a point about that in, in, in a bit. But about 852, that's, that's when Joram or Jehoram assumed the throne in Israel. This is 2 Kings chapter 3. Now, just a word about the setting because a lot of things are going on. This is the period of the divided kingdom. And uh, there are national threats for God's people. And uh, there are battles that are recorded here. In the third chapter there's a battle with the king of Edom and God intervenes with that so that the, especially Jehoshaphat to the south the king of Judah who was also on the opposing team so that he uh, opposing uh, side of the army um, so that he did not perish but all were spared but God intervened and that would have been a national disaster and then in the fourth chapter, we see some wonderful expressions of God's will. This is, this is when Elisha raised the Shunammite's woman from the dead. And that's, that's amazing. And we're going to have in chapter 5, Naaman, the captain of the Syrian army, who was a leper. And he would take back with him, once he was cleansed from his leprosy by God, as he obeyed the instructions of the prophets, he would take back with him to Syria the knowledge of the true God. And it wasn't that just Naaman benefited. 
When he was healed, he said, Now I know there's no God in all the earth save the God of Israel. And he took that knowledge with him back to Syria. So all that, those are some things that have happened before 2 Kings 6. And then after that, I don't know how much time has passed after Na- Naaman has, has been there in chapter 5. But there are raiding bands that are coming from Syria. And we see that God delivers Israel. And then Ben-Hadad brings all the army and God's going to deliver Israel again. What I'm saying is, we're reading about an axe head, an iron axe head, in the first seven verses of 2 Kings chapter 6. And if we're not careful, maybe am I speaking just for myself? This is no respect to the word, disrespect to the Word of God. But I mean, as far as just the item itself, the iron axe head, doesn't that seem a little trivial? at first glance, to be recorded in the context where there's so much going on. There's so many big crises where God is intervening on behalf of His people. And here in the mix of all that, we have a record about an iron axe head. I will admit to you that in my years of preaching, in my few decades of preaching, that I've not used this as a, the text of a sermon before. But I thought, the more I looked at that, and I was challenged by why is that included? What is the message that God wants us to get from this text of Scripture? I'll tell you, I'm, I'm glad that the prophet got the ax. I'm glad that this is recorded, because there's some great lessons there. But the first thing that we have to do, I think, is to address what I just said earlier in terms of how at first glance, I mean just to be honest, just at first glance on the surface, doesn't that seem to be out of culture with all these other weighty matters and here's a a deal about an axe head that flies off the handle and goes into the Jordan, why is that in the Bible? So the first thing that we have to do I think is to realize that we are worlds away. We are worlds away from the setting. When we look at this through 21st century eyes in America, and we look back at this situation as we would look at losing an axe head, it's so easy for us to miss the point. Historically, what had earlier happened in the days of the United Kingdom, do you remember in the days of Saul, that it is pointed out that Israel was way behind in the iron industry. You know the Iron Age as such is dated starting about 1200 B.C. But the Philistines, they had the upper hand. And in fact, uh, in in the days of Saul, there was no blacksmith in Israel. Now, I don't mean that that had not changed. I'm just saying they they had been lagging behind in the production of iron, for sure, because we can learn that. But just to make an axe, the amount of wood that had to be gathered, first to get the ore and to burn... Uh, to, to, to have the fire that was capable of melting that and then to shape it into the iron axe head in that time. That's enormous expense. It was an enormous amount of work. And he's lost that axe head. Now, you might be thinking, well, why doesn't he just go down to the hardware store and buy one? See, that's what we would do, isn't it? If we lost the accent. Just go to the hardware store. Just go to some supply store and get you another one. Well, this young prophet would have said, with what? There's not discretionary spending. There's, it's not that there's a store down the road he could go buy one. And besides that, this is something that was borrowed. You, you, you can't really compare what it would be for us to lose an axe head and say that, that's his problem back then. It, you have to do something else. It's almost like if you have borrowed someone's car. You had to borrow a car. And you wrecked the car. And you don't have the money to replace it. I mean, he, he's, he's really, he's really in, in a fix here. So when we, when we look at this as, as trivial, probably in the first place, 
we're not seeing it from his standpoint. It was, it was a large expense. It was something that was borrowed. He did not have the wherewithal to pay it. Uh, we're talking about where God intervenes, it turns out, not with something that anyone could call trivial. This young man sure didn't think it was trivial. God is intervening on behalf of a, of a real need that was in this man's life. You know it takes wisdom to know what our real needs are. Have you thought about that? Some time back, Linda and I made a trip to Roswell to see Seth and the kids. And um, little Renoa, who knows everything, I think, she was eight years old at the time. She's had a birthday since then. But for some reason, she sat Linda and myself down, and she said, there is a difference between needs and wants. She's eight years old. She said, for examples, for examples, I might want a Barbie doll, but I don't need a Barbie doll. And Leon, who was 10 and kind of eavesdropping on the conversation, he, he came in to give his two bits. He said, yeah, Renoa, another thing we, we need is fun because we don't want to die of sorrows. Well, I, I thought they both had a pretty good point there. Uh, we do need some fun. We don't want to die of sorrows. Um, a Barbie doll is probably something we want, but don't necessarily need. So they may be on the right track. It takes wisdom to know that. We may think we need multiple phones and, and cars and clothes, and on, on our list goes. We just need that, but that doesn't mean those are really in the categories of needs from the divine perspective. It takes wisdom to know what is a real need and what is not. What I'm saying, though, is that in this case, God is intervening on behalf of a real need. Could I mention something else to you just in the passing here? And that is perhaps an observation about the providence of God. Not only do we see miraculous working, but the providence of God. When that when that young man who was in the school of the prophets, you do understand, I've not said anything about that, but going back to the days of Samuel, there were the company of the prophets, the schools of the prophets. And they would gather themselves around men like Samuel, then later like Elijah, and now under Elisha, and they would be schooled by him, they would be taught by him, by the prophet. But anyway, when, when that young man among those prophets in training, the company of the prophets, these men that were being taught by Elisha, when, when he said, uh, would, you, would you go with us when, when we go on this project to, to fell the trees and make the beams and, and build, build a larger place for us? Uh, Elisha had given his blessing. He said, yes, go. But there was one that said, uh, would you go with us? And he said, I will go. And it may well be that what we're seeing there is the providence of God because you wouldn't pay that. It just sounds like courtesy. You know, you ask him to go. He says he will go. Nothing much to that. But what if Elisha had not gone? What if he had not been asked? What if he had not gone? What if he had not been there? And so the, the, the timing here that puts him at the right place so that God can work through him on this occasion, I believe points to the very providence of God. And we don't know about things like that. We don't know how many times something that might seem to just be a matter of courtesy uh, just, just something you haven't put a whole lot of thought into, that, that those kinds of things are working together for God to accomplish His purpose. So, here's what happens. When the axe flies off the handle, the iron axe head flies off the handle and into the water, and alas, Master, for it was borrowed. It's interesting there in verse 5, the, this young man doesn't really ask Elisha to do anything. Maybe that's implicit. <laughs> Alas, it was borrowed. He's not, but he doesn't say, would you please do something? He just cries out, and the man of God says, where did it fall? Elisha's the man of God. And he pointed it to him. Now, I've been to this area here in the Jordan River, which is near Jericho, on several occasions. And I will tell you that it's not the clearest at this point. It probably wasn't then the clearest at this point. 
I don't think it's a case where you can see to the bottom and you, it's clear enough you can look down there and you see it. He just points, it fell there. And so Elisha cut off a stick, threw it there, and made the iron float. I don't try to give this a naturalistic explanation. You know, you, you, read, you read some guys and they're, they're working hard to figure out a way that this could have happened without a miracle. And so they have Elisha probing along there and finding it or the, the, the hollow spot there where the, where the axe handle would have gone. So he, he finds it. This isn't recording Elisha's dexterity, his skill at, at finding something there in the river and bringing it up. It's, it's, a, it's a miracle of God. So he throws it in there and the axe head floats. And he told the prophet, go get it. And he did. Now, as far as the immediate need, God is working through the prophets at this time in, in unusual ways. The miracles of the Bible are not just equally dispersed from Genesis to Revelation. That's not the way it happens. There are clusters of miracles. There are the, the miracles of creation. There are the miracles that occur in the Exodus there are miracles that occur with the prophets. There are miracles that occur with the ministry of Christ and the apostles. So when God is inaugurating a new period, when there is something very special taking place, when there's some outstanding need, as needed the miracles came, but it wasn't that this just happened all the time in biblical history. But see, Israel, because of the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who had made the golden calves and Dan and Bethel and unauthorized priest and changed the feast day and the people were just departing from God and sinning against him and to make matters worse when Ahab had married Jezebel they made Baal the state religion. So people were worshiping Baal, they were worshiping Jeroboam's gods and they were just departing from him just as fast as they could go and God took extraordinary means at this time to try to bring them back. See, each miracle is saying, look what I can do. Look what I want to do. I, I want to bring you back to myself. And so we see that kind of outreach. And you can be sure everybody would have heard about this and, been, and would have been talking about the mighty power of God. So there was a reason why this happened then at that time to benefit those people. Let me challenge you to think about it this way. When would this book that we're looking at have been put in written form? Now, remember the date that I gave you earlier? You remember that, don't you? 852, right about that time. All right, let's turn to 2 Kings 25 to see uh, again when this book would have been written in its final form put together. Now, 2 Kings 25 records the fall and the captivity of, of Judah. And then it talks about one of the kings. The next to the last king was Jeconiah. He had been taken into captivity. And where the book of 2 Kings ends, in 2 Kings 25, it says it came to pass in the 37th year of the captivity of Jehoiachin, king of Judah. Now that captivity of Je Jehoiachin or Jeconiah or Coniah, he just has three names for you to keep up with. But that took place in 597 BC. And so in the 37th year, so now we are at 561 BC. And it tells us that it is at that point that there's another king. This is a Babylonian king and his name is Evil Merodach of Babylon. You're going to remember all these names, aren't you? evil Merodach of Babylon. And so the point of it is that in that year he released Jehoiachin from prison. Now that doesn't mean he went back to Israel. But what it says is he's not in prison anymore. He comes out of prison and he eats at the king's table. The king spoke kindly to him, the king of Babylon, verse 28, and gave him a more prominent seat with those of the kings who were with him in Babylon. So he changed his prison garments. He ate bread regularly before the king all the days of his life. And so here is a book that, again, in its completed form, where, where you would have the book of Kings, not where it's in the pro process maybe with earlier things being written, but now when it's completed, it, goes, it reaches down to the days of Jeconiah's release from prison, 
561 B.C. Can you do the math? From 852 to 561, let's just round it off. We're talking about 300 years. So really, not just when people this orally would have been told about, everybody would have been talking about, did you hear what happened with, with Elisha and that axe head that floated and uh, contemporary and, and God's purpose then? But see, 300 years later, in the days of the Babylonian captivity, the captives are reading what God did with this man's axe head. You see, the people that were reading about this when it was put together, and now can, they can read about this, in the days of the captivity, they've lost their homes. They've lost their kingdom. They have been displaced. They have been taken to Babylon. They've lost much more than an axe head. They felt vulnerable. So the ones that are reading this, who have lost their kingdom, and lost their land, and lost their houses, and they're reading about what we just read this morning in the days of the captivity. They're reading about the mighty work of God who intervened to get this iron axe head back to this man of God. And see, that would give them hope. If God cared for his axe head, do you suppose he cares for those of us in the captivity? Will he intervene on our behalf? And see, that's exactly what God wanted the people in captivity to see. Um, Hank this morning read from the prophet Jeremiah as we entered into this worship period. Turn with me to the book of Jeremiah for another passage, just a couple of verses. But look with me please to Jeremiah chapter 16. Now the book of Jeremiah reaches down to approximately the same time that the end of Kings reaches down to, as far as the time is concerned. He's, in other words, he's writing about the same time. In, in Jeremiah chapter 16, look at verse 14. Therefore, behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, it shall no more be said. Now, this is what Jeremiah is saying to the captives. It shall more be said, no more be said, the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of Egypt. Now, what's he talking about? That's the past, well, that's the Exodus. And each year they commemorated the Exodus with the Passover. And by the way, they still do even today. Remember that. The Jews do. But here they were, if, if you wanted to talk about the Lord, if you wanted to swear in the name of the Lord, you would say, as the Lord lives who brought Israel up out of the land of Egypt. He said they won't say that anymore. To the captives he says, But the Lord lives who brought up the children of Israel from the land of the north and from all the lands where he had driven them. For I will bring them back to their land which I gave to their fathers. You see, this is something I never would have thought about at all. You, you would think, what's the greatest event? The exodus from Egypt that God by a mighty hand after the ten plagues brought Israel out of Egypt, crossed the Red Sea, and on their way to the land of Canaan. Or what he's going to do with these people in the captivity. What's the greater event? The Lord says, as great as it was when I brought Israel out of Egypt with a mighty hand, that will be eclipsed by what I'm about to do with the captives. Well, how do they know God can do that? If that's not just Jeremiah talking, read about what he did with the axe head. Read about what he did with the series. Read about what he did with that Shunammite woman. You see, all this is written to show the power of God. But the ones that are reading these things in Kings are reading it in the days of the captivity when God's about ready to take them back to the land and say, get busy and rebuild the temple. When God is ready to carry on his, his purpose through the ones that would return. And so that puts a different light on it, doesn't it? And, and maybe it, it tells us why that, that this thing that at first glance would, would not seem to be the most important act that God could do, in fact, is very much in keeping with what the people needed at this time. They needed to know the power of God and that God sees everything and God cares. 
and he's able to intervene on behalf of those things that are true needs. They would rebuild the temple, as hopeless as that seemed. And with all the opposition that the Samaritans and Ammonites and others combined would put against them, with Nehemiah's help, they rebuilt the wall in 52 days after it had been ruined all those years. You see, that's, that's the power of God. Okay. So we've seen what God did for the people that really lived at that time. But also we've seen how the ones that were first reading this in written form, how their faith would have been uplifted if they took it to heart. But is there a message for us today? Romans 15 and verse 4 says, The things written aforetime are written for our learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Philippians chapter 4 and verse 19. Paul said, my God shall supply all your needs. Do you believe that? And how do you know that's true? Well, the prophet got the ax. We have many examples where God supplied the need. Matthew 10 and verse 30. The very hairs of your head are all numbered. You know, if, if you love a person with all of your heart, and they were to say to you, Hey, uh, would you like to know my hair count? Would you like to know my, how many hairs I have on my head? What would you, how many, what would you say? Uh, I like your hair, but probably not. You know, that, that, that. We don't care. But God cares. The smallest thing, the very hairs of your head are numbered. Isn't it comforting to you to know that there's nothing about you that God doesn't see? There's nothing about you God doesn't know. There's nothing about you God doesn't care about. The very hairs of your head are numbered. And so I turn to Philippians chapter 4. I turn to Philippians chapter 4. And I read in verse 6. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be made known to God. And the peace of God which surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Comforting words. Comforting words. God cares for you. The peace of God that passes understanding. Don't be anxious. With prayer, supplication, let your request be made known to God. Hebrews 13, 5. Let your conversation be without covetousness. Be content with such things as you have. For he himself hath said, I will never leave you, nor will I ever forsake you. So that the Lord, so that we may say with boldness, I will not fear what shall man do unto me. Matthew 6, 26. Look at the birds of the air, for they neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, yet your Father feeds them. Are you, of not, more, are you not of more value than they? Matthew 10, 29. Are not two sparrows sold for a copper coin? And not one of them falls to the ground apart from your Father's will? Let me tell you, folks, God's eye is on the sparrow. This is the eye that sees each sparrow fall. You are of more value than sparrows. He cares for the birds. But he cares for you and he cares for me. And one reason I know that is because of that day that the prophet got the axe. Isn't that amazing? There's no problem that is too big for God. There's no, nothing too vast for Him because He is El Shaddai. He is God Almighty. He is omnipotent. And so there's nothing too vast for Him, nothing too hard for Him. Heaven is His throne. The earth is His footstool. Yet he cares for you. And your axe head matters to him. 
one author said, perhaps 2 Kings 6, 1 through 7 is not a massive compendium of theology, but nevertheless may be precisely the word of God you need just now. So don't despise this little word of God. Aren't you glad at least this once that God gave the preacher the ax? And so I think that um, there are many lessons there for the learning, don't you? In 2 Kings chapter 6. Our Lord died for you. He could have called six legions of angels. They were there. They were ready. But he went ahead. He died for us. He was raised from the dead. He ascended into heaven. And he invites us to come to him because he cares for us. He wants to save our soul. He wants us to make us conformed to his own image. And he wants to, us, he wants to prepare us for heaven. If you're in any way subject to our Lord's invitation this morning, we encourage you to come as together we stand and sing.